Part 1. Course Information First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello. I wonder if you could help me. I am interested in enrolling in your MBA programme. Could you give me some information, please? Yes, of course. I'll take a few details first of all, and I'll give you a copy of our prospectus. Oh, that's OK. I already have one here. I've been researching the MBA courses in the local area, so I already have lots of course information. That's great. OK, so first of all, can you tell me your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Anne Horbury. Horbury. Is that H-A-W-B-E-R-R-Y? Yes, that's right. OK. And what's your date of birth, Ms Horbury? The 22nd of May, 1981. That's great. And you were born in the UK? Yes, I was. All right. Can you give me some contact details, please? Sure. My address is 26 Simon Place in Brighton. And my telephone number is 01903 714 721. Sorry, can you tell me your contact number once again? Yes, it's 01903 714 721. OK, great. And do you have a mobile phone number? No, I don't. Is it important? No, that's OK. I'll just write it on your form, no mobile phone. Now, just a few additional questions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Are you working or studying anywhere else at the moment? Yes, I'm working for Lloyd Enterprise in the city as a secretary and I'm also attending a computer course part-time in the evenings. Great. So can you give me some details about your educational background? We need to make sure that your qualifications match the entry requirements. Yes. I completed a business degree a year ago. I've been working since my graduation, but the job market is very competitive these days, so I'd like to do some postgraduate study now. OK, that sounds fine. Your degree is relevant, and it's good that you have some work experience too. I do need to warn you, though, that our MBA programme is extremely popular and gets full quickly. So would you be interested in applying for any alternative courses if your application is not successful this time? Well, my first choice would, of course, be the MBA. But yes, I've had a good look through your prospectus and I would also be interested in the international marketing course. That's great. It's always a good idea to keep your options open just in case. Finally, can you tell me where you learned about our courses here? Actually, my cousin studied the MBA course two years ago, and she recommended it to me. OK, well, thank you for coming in today. I will pass your details on to our admissions department. They should contact you this week with a formal application form, and they usually invite MBA candidates to come in for an interview. OK, well, thanks for your time. No problem. Good luck with your application. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. 
he made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 15. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. So, the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help. And as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area, and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave, and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Good afternoon, and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon, I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over seven hundred tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports. Stations, historic landmarks and towns, and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says "Tourist Information." The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries, as well as provide essential maps, guides, and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London, and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports, and central London underground stations, payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used, and these come in ten, twenty. Forty, one hundred, and two hundred units, and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars, and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are twenty-four hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow, and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from nine thirty to three thirty, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyro Banks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 to 5:30 weekdays, 9 to 12:30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are eight to eight weekdays and Saturdays, and ten to five on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores, and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged. As these vary considerably, wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or bureau de change, which conforms to the BTA code of conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about product life cycles. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I'm going to begin my lecture today with a look at product life cycles. Now, as we go through the product life cycle, I will be trying to raise some issues which are important with regard to each phase of the cycle. I won't have all the answers for you this morning. This one of the lecture series is just to get you started, and I hope interested. Let's start with the first phase of the cycle, that of product design. This is really the most important part of the cycle. We often talk as if it is consumers who are responsible for recycling, and so they are. But in reality, the major responsibility must be borne by designers. They can design products where recycling is easy and cheap, or difficult and expensive. In the latter case. The likelihood is that recycling, though technically feasible, will not in fact take place. Now, don't jump ahead because the second stage is not product manufacturing, but rather that of materials acquisition. This is the activity we do when we mine coal or other minerals such as gold or iron or copper. In addition to mining. There is harvesting, which includes the cutting down of trees as a first step in the making of furniture or paper, or fishing. These activities have costs, which are not only money costs. Pollution is one of the extra costs. We have also to think whether the resources we use are renewable, such as trees, or not, such as coal and other minerals. The third stage is not manufacturing either. It is materials processing. This is where we take the raw materials and use energy to change them into a form that can be used in manufacturing.、Uh, for example, trees must be turned into paper or oil into plastic. The cotton plants that grow in the fields must be turned into cloth. All of these activities require the use of chemical processes, and as with all chemical processes, waste is produced. Often of a dangerous kind, and now we come to the manufacturing stage. This is usually the most expensive in terms of cost and energy and waste. The wastes are often those that contribute to global climate change. For example, we make forty-one billion glass containers, mostly bottles, each year, and we throw most of them away. A lot of manufacturing seems unnecessary if we could only organise things better, and this could mean greater profits for the manufacturing companies too. Stage five is packaging. Many products are packed in paper or plastic, which themselves, of course, have their own processes and costs. Excessive packaging is often criticised, but it must be remembered that packaging serves a purpose. Often more than one purpose, such as maintaining freshness and hygiene, as well as providing information. In our globalized world, we must never forget the next stage, which is distribution. This is the stage where transportation and energy play a big part. Lorries, trucks, trains, planes, and ships all use up the precious stocks of oil, and as we know. Generate greenhouse gases, which, as we hear again and again, contribute to climate change. Stage seven is the point of it all: using the product. 
looking after products, using them in the recommended ways, timely repair and maintenance all reduce the need for early replacement and reduce the number of products in landfill sites. We should not encourage the purchase of single-use products, that is, products which are designed for use on one occasion only and then to be thrown away and replaced. Um, I'm going to skip a stage for a moment and move straight on to the final stage, which is disposal, putting the product in the bin. This is the end of the life of the product and we lose it completely. It may have only a little value, but it does have a value even at this stage of its life, even in fact when it's actually in the landfill site. Now, I missed out one stage. This is a cycle within a cycle. That is, within the life cycle of the product, there can be a closed loop cycle which can extract more value from the product. This is the reuse and recycle loop. It is a closed loop because, in theory, it can continue forever, though in practice, of course, this is not possible. Recycling products mean that they can be used to make more of the same product. Uh, CDs, bottles, books, or that they can be used to make different ones. For example, one pound of recycled paper can make six cereal boxes. And if we recycled all our newspapers, we could save 40,000 trees a day. Now, with this approach to the life cycle of a product in mind, we can go on to consider life cycle analysis. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.